Okay, so this should be the final video in the lecture series on photosynthesis. So we start off with a comparison of chemiosmosis in the chloroplast and the mitochondria. And I know that we've talked about this a lot, but you know, as long as we keep driving it home, then um, the more you'll understand it. So chloroplast and mitochondria, because we just talked about the light dependent reactions, right? And, and ATP is generated through the process of chemiosmosis in the light dependent reactions. So this is just a quick review before we get into the Calvin cycle. So chloroplasts and mitochondria generate ATP by chemiosmosis, but they use different sources of energy, right? So the mitochondria will transfer chemical energy from food uh, to ATP, whereas the chloroplasts will transform the light energy into the chemical energy of ATP. Um, the spatial organization of chemiosmosis differs between chloroplasts and the mitochondria, but they also show similarities. So in the mitochondria, the protons are pumped to the intermembrane space, and they drive ATP synthesis as they diffuse back into the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so in the mitochondria, protons are pumped to the intermembrane space, and they drive ATP synthesis as they diffuse back into the mitochondrial matrix. This process is contributed mostly by a membrane potential difference. Whereas in chloroplasts, the protons are pumped into the thylakoid space rather than the intermembrane space, and they drive ATP synthesis as they diffuse back into the stroma rather than the mitochondrial matrix. And then this process is contributed mostly by a pH gradient instead of a membrane potential. Um, so here's the two organelles side by side again. And so the intermembrane space in the mitochondrion, this would be called the thylakoid space in the chloroplast. The intermitochondrial membrane in the mitochondrion would be called the thylakoid membrane in the chloroplast. And then the matrix in the mitochondrion would be called the stroma in the chloroplast. But other than that, you can see that the process of chemiosmosis is relatively the same, right? So we're getting uh, hydrogen protons that are diffusing down their concentration gradient from the area of high concentration in the intermembrane space or the thylakoid space um, into the matrix or the stroma. And then that proton motive force is what um, drives the ATP synthase to change its conformational shape in the active site and then you know spin its rotor and then in the process generate ATP. Okay, and that's what we call chemiosmosis. All right, so moving on to the Calvin cycle. So the Calvin cycle uses the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH to reduce carbon dioxide to sugar. So in general, what happens? Carbon enters the cycle as CO2 and then leaves as a sugar named glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P, okay? For... Um, for the next synthesis of 1G3P, the cycle must take place three times. And actually, I should have bolded that. That's very important. Okay. Fixing three molecules of CO2. Okay. So for every 1G3P, we have to fix three molecules of carbon dioxide. And each molecule of carbon dioxide enters the cycle one at a time. Right. So that's what I mean by the Calvin cycle has to happen three times. Okay. So the Calvin cycle also has three phases. One is called carbon fixation, which is catalyzed by the uh, a very popular enzyme, Rubisco. And then the second one is reduction. And then the third phase is regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor. Okay. So first thing, carbon fixation, um, aka the Calvin cycle. But really, it's the first stage of the Calvin cycle. But it's it's the most important. <laughs> okay. So carbon fixation is catalyzed by an enzyme called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. Okay, ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And in layman's terms, just known as Rubisco. And that's what you can call it as, Rubisco. You are not required to remember this whole long name. Okay, so in the first stage of the Calvin cycle, we have um, carbon dioxide that's getting fixed into two, three carbon molecules. But in general, if we mix carbon dioxide, mix, excuse me, combine carbon dioxide and water, if we combine them to make a carbohydrate, that by itself is an unfavorable reaction. So it has to be coupled to 
a favorable one in order to drive it. So this is the central reaction of carbon fixation, and it's very, very important. Okay, so in this reaction, we're taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and we're combining it with a five carbon compound. And this five carbon compound is called ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, okay, plus water. All right, so combining those three things together and using the enzyme Rubisco, we would then generate um, a six carbon intermediate actually, but that six carbon intermediate is really unstable, so it ends up breaking up into two three carbon molecules, and that's what we call three phosphoglycerate. Okay, so we get two molecules of three phosphoglycerate. So this is the car the carbon fixing reaction, and this um, was discovered in 1948, and the enzyme Rubisco is thought to be the most, not only the most abundant protein on Earth, but it's also thought to be the most important, especially in the chloroplast. Okay, so definitely make a star of Rubisco. Okay, so um, now we're moving on into the Calvin cycle, right? So each CO2 molecule that is fixed consumes three ATP and two NADPHs. Okay, and if I remind you, remember we have three CO2 molecules that have to be fixed in total. So if each one consumes three ATP and two NADPHs, then that means that ultimately, um, if you multiply that by three, then that means that the Calvin cycle as a whole, um, after three CO2 molecules are fixed, that means that nine ATP has been consumed and six NADPHs have been consumed. Okay, so keep that in mind. So here we go. The reaction of fixing carbon dioxide is energetically favorable because of the Rubisco enzyme. That's very important. The Calvin cycle starts when three molecules of CO2 are fixed by Rubisco to produce six molecules of the three phosphoglycerate, right? Because it's two per CO2 molecule. So now with that being said, if we're counting our carbons, then we have 18 carbons total. So then those 18 carbons will then undergo a cycle of reactions that regenerate the three molecules of ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate that was used in the initial carbon fixation step, okay? So now we have 15 carbons. This will leave one molecule of G3P as our net gain, right? So we have 15 carbons that are found in the ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate, but then we have three carbons that are found in that uh, the net gain of the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, right? One molecule of it. And this molecule is super important because that, um, if you remember from respiration, it served as an intermediate in, in cell respiration, right? So our net equation then from the Calvin cycle is we use three molecules of carbon dioxide plus nine ATP plus six NADPHs plus water, and then we yield. Uh, one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And then, of course, you know, the inorganic phosphate, ADP and NADP+. Okay, so here's the picture of it. Our input, we have three molecules of CO2. They enter one at a time. Our first phase is the carbon fixation, right, where we're using Rubisco um, to fix carbon dioxide into our two, three carbon intermediates, the three phosphoglycerate. Um, and then in the process of reduction and regeneration, uh, we're taking these phosphoglycerates, which we now have, if we're going with three CO2s, we now have 18 carbons total, right? And so out of those 18 carbons, 15 of them are regenerating back into ribulose bisphosphate to be used again. And then the other three are um, fixed into the output of one molecule of G3P or glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Okay, so again, for every one net G3P, it requires nine ATP and six NADPHs from the light reaction um, in the thylakoid membrane. Okay, so G3P is then transferred into the cytosol, uh, where it's converted into sucrose through, you know, a bunch of different reactions which are not required, you know, that's beyond the scope of the AP exam, okay? But so, for example, as an analogy, just like glucose is transported in the blood of animals, sucrose is the major form um, in which the sugar is transported between plant cells, okay? So think glucose, animals, and sucrose plants. Okay, so here's a practice problem. The chemical reaction for photosynthesis is 
6 carbon dioxide plus 12 water plus light energy yields glucose plus 6 oxygen plus 6 water. If the input water is labeled with a radioactive isotope of oxygen, then the oxygen gas released as the reaction proceeds is also labeled with oxygen. Which of the following is the most likely explanation? During So we have our choices. A. Um, during the light reactions of photosynthesis, water is split, the hydrogen atoms combine with the CO2, and oxygen gas is released. While water is split, that is true, the hydrogen atoms do not combine with the CO2, that is not true, and oxygen gas is released, that's true. So A is um, incorrect. Okay, part B. During the light reactions of photosynthesis, water is split, that's true, removing electrons and protons, that's true, and oxygen gas is released, that's true. So B could be a viable option. Part C. During the Calvin cycle, water is split, no, regenerating NADPH from NADP+, plus, no, and oxygen gas is released, no. So that is incorrect. And... Option D, during the Calvin cycle, water is split, no. The hydrogen atoms are added to intermediates of sugar synthesis, yikes, and oxygen gas is released, no, okay? So that would be incorrect. So the correct answer for this one would be B. Okay, um, so plants have developed in, because obviously photosynthesis, our, our first photosynthetic organisms that we talked about in the intro video, they were aquatic. Okay, so over time, when the plants um, started moving on to land, they had to adapt uh, to different climates. Okay, and so we've had, there's alternative mechanisms of carbon fixation have evolved in hot and very arid climates or dry climates. Okay, so when the plants moved to land, they evolved uh, what we call metabolic adaptations to the hot climates. Okay, and so in particular, the plants, they had to adapt to balancing between um, performing photosynthesis and then also um, losing excessive water through transpiration, right? Because if it's a really hot climate, then the plant's going to want to close its stomata and not release as much. It's going to want to retain its water so that it can conserve it. Um, but if it closes its stomata, then we run into the problem of not getting enough carbon dioxide. And if we don't get enough carbon dioxide, then the plant can't, you know, perform photosynthesis. So instead, what happens is that um, the plants will what we call photorespire or perform photorespiration. But photorespiration is not good because photorespiration uses up oxygen and releases CO2 but it doesn't produce any energy. And it also uses up oxygen, right? And it's releasing CO2 in the environment, which is not what we need, right? We need O2 and not CO2. Um, so when the plant is undergoing photorespiration, they don't have enough carbon dioxide, so they can't make G3P. But there's actually something worse than that than that, that happens. Like, that's bad, but then there's something worse than that that happens. So the oxygen will actually jump into the Calvin cycle and it will make a different chemical that doesn't do anything um, beneficially for the cell. And so then therefore, we actually start seeing a reduction in what we call C3 plants. And a C3 plant is um, a normal, plant. it's like m most of our plants are C3 plants. And we call them C3 plants because that means that they make um, the three carbon G3P molecule, okay? So anyway, um, if we don't have enough carbon dioxide, then the oxygen comes in and makes a molecule that's not uh, useful for them at all. And so then therefore they end up um, wilting away as well. So we do have two evolutionary solutions. And like I said, you don't have to know this for the EP exam, but it's still pretty good just to be aware of it. So it helps you understand a little bit better. Um, and these evolutionary solutions are, we have C4 plants, like that would be sugarcane or corn. And what they do is they take in the carbon dioxide and they will use a particular enzyme to make a four carbon molecule instead of a three carbon molecule. So then those four carbon molecules will move to what we call bundle sheath cells, which are arranged more so around the veins of the plant. And then they introduce carbon dioxide into the Calvin cycle that way. The second thing is called a cam plant, and that's like a cacti or a pineapple. And the cam plants are cool because they only open their stomata at night, 
and they uptake the CO2 and then they'll store it as malic acid. And then during the day, they use that malic acid in the Calvin cycle to produce G3P. So that's it.